Our guest today on One on One is Chinaye Imba Uzuko. Has a 30-year career in marketing, communications, multimedia and enterprise software development. E-learning technology strategy, software development and change transformation strategy in health, education and governance. He founded the multiple award-winning technology solutions pioneer Infographics Nigeria and also worked in Microsoft Cooperation as general manager. Anglophone West Africa. Departing in 2009 to pursue his vision of a borderless Africa in his current role as the managing partner of Grand Central and lead partner of IX Consult, a boutique startup incubator. He is the president, Institute of Software Practitioners of Nigeria, a trustee education reform intervention team. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, so you're you're a technology consultant. How did you get so passionate about education? First, first of all, I, I got into university to study veterinary medicine and eventually left veterinary medicine to start to read political science and then ended up in technology. Okay. So I came, I've been through many areas and usually through the back door, you know, kind of like figuring out, oh, this sounds, this looks interesting, this looks interesting. Um, what, it, what, it, what, it, what it has led me to is a conviction that, that success, success actually begins with education. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else. Literally, if you have, um, we're all born with certain gifts, certain abilities, certain talents. If you do not pass through education and a solid education, you will have great difficulty being successful in life. So I started to focus more on education, education technology, and that led us into education reform, looking at, at things around how do, you, how do you actually create capacity at a national level for um, quality education. So I've been doing that for about 18 years now. Wow, okay. So let's start with the elephant in the room. How do we stop the incessant ASO strike to, you know, and get a, you know, a more progressive solution? Oh, that's a big, 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 big elephant. Okay, so ASO strikes for a reason. Okay. And if you really want to solve the problem of the strike, you have to remove the reason. But I think over the last 30 years of ASU strikes, um, that reason may not be so clear to all of us anymore, mm -hmm. including ASU, and perhaps even the federal government that actually is the, is the protagonist on the other side. Um, and, and what was the reason? The fundamental reason for a union is to protect the welfare of its members. And that's what ASU does. It has mm -hmm. to protect the welfare of the academic staff of the universities. And so that's its reason for existence. But it operates within a sector that is supposed to also take responsibility for. And it has broadened that understanding of the welfare of its members to include the welfare of the entire education, tertiary education system. So they kind of like stand as representatives, but they're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. There's the non-academic staff union, there's a student union, there are different groups that are in that ecosystem mm -hmm. that take care of the various constituencies within the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So ASU doesn't stand solely for the entire ecosystem. So what does that lead us to? It means that, that the reason for us to, if you make the staff welfare um, as they desire it to be, or as a country desires it to be, then there will be no strikes. But when you unpack that, you start to see a lot of other issues that are involved. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and one of the biggest questions that, that we need to ask ourselves is around, um, you know, you pay somebody a wage and you're paying that person a wage for productivity. If the output is not forthcoming, then what do you do? In the private sector, you let the person go. You try to get them to produce. You work on training and reskilling and retooling. And eventually, if it doesn't work out, you ask the person to go. Asu's perspective is that if we say that they are not performing as they have themselves admitted, that they're not producing graduates of world, of world, world standard, world-class standard, they say the reason is because we have not created the environment. The owners of the schools have not created the environment for them to work. But you and I went to school. I went to school in Nigeria. You probably went to school in Nigeria. Um, if the students were asked the question today, um, um, over the past 10, 20 years, they would tell you clearly that um, there are other issues which we must be truthful about. And one of the most important, in fact, um, I don't even, we don't even need to go far. If you look at the reports, there was a 189 slide um, report that was produced in 2012, I think, when the, um, the government then said, they would sit down with ASU and they would examine the universities, the state of the universities. Okay. And they went to about 61 universities and they came up with this report, so 189 uh, slides in that, in that deck. When you go to the summary, the first problem, by the way, the president of ASU is a, was a member of that team. 
Okay. The current uh, pr president. Not of the Arsenal. current president. This was in 2012. Okay. Yeah. Um, he was a member of that of that of that team. And the report says the number one problem in Nigerian universities, the Nigerian university system, is leadership and governance. Leadership and governance. That was the first problem mm. that they identified. Of course, they identified infrastructure issues, which is you know kind of like classrooms, Classroom, hostels, yeah. and things like that. But it's, it's, it's very significant that the truth was told. The central problem of the universities is leadership and governance. And if you trace the, 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 the problems that we have in a tertiary institution back to the source, you will find that the university, the decline in tertiary education actually began with the failure of leadership and the failure of governance. Leadership in terms of, of um, within the universities themselves, the quality of the vice chancellors that were elected into office, the quality mm -hmm. of the deans of the, of, the, of the faculties and the heads of departments, where it moved more into the political realm than it did into their performance for the function for which, I mean, for the purpose for which they were employed. That's leadership. And then you go into governance. And governance is about the quality framework. What happens fundamentally when you have a system that its production, what it produces is intangible. Hmm. You take a student at 16, 17, 18 years old, you pass him through a system or her through a system for four years, and the output of that four years is supposed to be a child that is ready to work in industry and be productive to society. True. That should be the measure. And on the basis of your capacity to produce those kind of students, you are then promoted through the system. You're also promoted through the system on the basis of your own productivity in terms of your research. Because a university lecturer does teaching and learning. So you instruct, right? And you instruct the generations that pass through you, but you also do new research to uncover new knowledge. Okay. And only when you uncover new knowledge can you publish. If you're not publishing, then what? So if you go and you look at that report in 2012, it says that 80% of the research of the publications coming from the university system was published to local journals. If you look at the, at the hierarchy, the governance structure for checking out, uh, for, for evaluating performance, the local journals, they are, they are all graded. The highest, of, co of course, is publishing when your paper is accepted at an international level. That's the highest level. If 80% of the output is in the local journals, and with no, mean, no, no intention to disrespect anyone, but that's the way that the system is structured, it means that the research output is poor. The teaching output is it's poor. poor. So where are we? Listening to the government, it says the famous 2009 agreement signed by the federal government to release 300 billion naira yearly for 1.3 trillion funding of facilities is unrealistic and is blaming past government. Shouldn't government be a continuum? Indeed, government has to be a continuum. So here, here is the thing. Government reached an agreement in 2009 okay. and was unable to implement it for various reasons. That agreement was later on revised. And I remember that it was uh, President Jonathan who took over the negotiations with ASU at some point. And he came from the university system himself and he sat in those meetings with them and they reached a resolution. And he even at some point actually is reported to have even overridden his, uh, his Minister of Finance at the time, um, uh, Dr. Okonjo Iwala, okay. and insisting that these funds would be released. So clearly he knew where he was going to get the funding from. But, what, but you always have to match that to government's other responsibilities. And, and this is where we, we have to ask ourselves fundamental questions. Yes, government is a continuum, but the circumstances in which agreements are reached don't stay the same. Hmm. This, was, this is where in the year 2020, approaching 2021, you're arguing about an agreement that was established, an agreement that was met in, two, in 2009. So 11 years later, you're insisting on the same thing. In fact, if we look at, the, um, at, at inflation, whatever was agreed on in 2009, in Naira terms, right? It was set in dollars, and in Naira terms, it is now three times that amount of money. Okay. So where is that money going to come from today? Do you want to, in, do you want to now um, increment that funding from 2009? And, and remember, the circumstances in 2009 carried through 11 years later. The universities have deteriorated even further over, 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 those, over those 11 years. So it goes back to that question. Yes, government is a continuum, but, but everybody knows that the context will always change. Why is funding just the priority and just the focus? Nobody's talking about you know, the leadership problems in universities. I think it's because you're asking the teacher to grade himself hmm. and not asking the students and not asking the parents. You know, if you're in a society where if you are marking your own exam, 
you there are certain things that you would you would ignore. True. In fairness to ASU, they they have they have mentioned at a number of times that they have challenges within their body, and some of those challenges they ascribe to politics. Um, you know, um, so in many of the universities now, there's this whole indigenization thing. So if you're not from that area, in that yeah. from that area, you don't become the vice chancellor. The indigenous insist <sighs> with a certain wow. number of lecturers and things like that. There are politicians who interfere in the hiring process. Um, and the, so the structure of the universities themselves has, has been kind of like infused by the system that we have in our country as a whole. Why is funding brought up? Because funding is what we can all understand. Remember, ASU is a union. And as a union, they would always, um, they have their own strategies around negotiation. The one thing that makes a lot of sense to all, all people who are involved in the ecosystem is that we want fancy universities, the kind that you send your children to abroad. You know, that's the refrain. Oh, you're sending your children abroad. The leaders send your children abroad to fancy schools, but they don't want to create sure. the same kind of environment locally. So people can relate to that. And it's a fantastic negotiating, negotiating chip. But the, and, and, but the issue is, 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 is bigger than that. Okay. And this is what bothers me the most. When we've had discussions, um, and we've had occasion to, to relate with ASU, I've been struck by the absence of a responsibility or accountability for envisioning education as a, for the entire society. Okay. There's How this narrow you? focus on the tertiary institution as though if you solve that problem, you've solved all problems. The tertiary institutions in this country have a gross enrollment of under 2 million students. Hmm. They have a staff strength, academic staff strength of under 100,000 across all 167 or 169 universities. At 2 million, which is, which is which at 2 million, that, that, that's about approximately 1% of our society, 1% of our, our population. The global benchmark for development impacting, for tertiary education impacting your GDP is 8%. Hmm. So we are, we, we, with the capacity of our system, we are just not producing enough intellectual capital for enough human capital to drive development in this country. And the answer doesn't lie in funding the current system. Indeed, what I, what, I, what I believe very strongly is that ASU and possibly even the federal government, they are locked into this fight that is a fight for the 19th century. Okay. They are struggling to rebuild structures and institutions and, and everything that belong in the 19th century and not in the 21st century. Nobody is talking about what should the new model of so education be. So how do be. we begin to get to those conversations? Because we can't get stuck here forever how do we begin to and i like what you said about how um we, parents because those are people that have the power the parents paying the school fees and the students benefiting from the system but in the current situation we have now the parents and the students are powerless you know they're unable to do anything so how do we begin to move that conversation forward how do i begin to have power as a parent in the public you know, university how do the students begin to have power because give for example um i did a course in you know uh, lagos business school for the for the first time that was right after i left university and they told me to grade my facilitator i thought it was a trap i was like in nigeria exactly. university you never do that so exactly. but how do we begin to move that conversation um you know forward you know as a country beyond just the federal um, government right now how do we do that I think, I think you've made a great point, um, and, 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 and let's, let's understand that in Nigeria, the, what, is called, what is now called the office of the citizen is an office that has been abandoned by the citizen themselves. Mm -hmm. we have, when you think about <coughs> elections over the past 20, 30 years, how has education ranked in terms of priorities that have been set by the electorate for what they want to see from their elected officials? Because you have to set your prioritization right. The truth is that we haven't set education as a priority. And, mm -hmm. it's, and if you look at our budgets, it explains that. Because in the budgets, the education budgets, 80% of the money goes to recurrent expenditure and 20% to capital. So you're not, certainly not growing. So you have a system where, you have, where, where your population is exploding. We say we have, and, 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 and that, I always go to numbers because numbers actually tell a story that, that you have to confront. Remember I said that there are only 2 million students in Nigeria's Nigeria universities. In, those, in that 2 million, only 5.3% of that is actually in private education, mm. private universities. The rest are in public, public schools, schools, which means that if you don't solve the problem of public education at a tertiary level, then you don't have an education system at tertiary level at all. Okay, please stay with us. We'll go on a short break and we'll be right back. Mm. 